Jesus, where would I be? Matthew chapter 5 tonight, please. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to spend most of our time in the book of Matthew. And uh, this is a topic that is needed, whether it be in a church, in a home, at work. Um, when you have people from different backgrounds, different cultures coming together, uh, there's always bound to be some level of disagreement, some level of conflict. It's just part of the human experience. And so tonight I want to focus on that subject, resolving Christian conflict, resolving Christian conflict. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, it might be that you have some conflict because you have wronged someone, or it might be that there's some conflict because someone has wronged you. And the Bible tells us what to do in both cases. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. The point of all these verses is this, that God, yes, of course, he doesn't want us killing one another. But he's also concerned with our hard attitudes towards one another. It goes beyond just an outward action. It goes straight to the heart. God, uh, Jesus enhanced God's law. Here he's talking about the heart condition of being angry with your brother without a cause. Uh, verse 23 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. He said, before you offer a sacrifice to the Lord, make sure things are right with your brother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please speak to our hearts. Lord, this is a common need in each of our lives. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll help us uh, to be biblical Christians that will follow the patterns you've set forth here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, it might be that you have wronged somebody, or it might be that somebody has wronged you. Let me say it this way, as I've said before, uh, think of the cross. You can't be right this way with God. I'm not trying to do the, thing, the sign of the cross here, okay? I'm not. Uh, but you can't be right this way with God if you're not right this way with man. You can't be right with God if you're not right with the people God has put into your life. Uh, 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, with your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Our relationships, including especially the marital relationship, affects our relationship with God. Uh, 1 John 4, 20, it says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar, for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Again, we cannot be right with God if we're wrong with a fellow Christian. We can't be right with God if we're wrong with the people in our lives. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 18, if you would. Notice Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. We saw so what the Bible says, if you have wronged somebody and you become aware of it, what should you do? You should make it right before you seek to offer sacrifices to God. God's interested. He's concerned with our human relationships. Look at Matthew chapter 18. What do you do if somebody has sinned against you? Matthew 18, verse 15. The Bible says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee. Notice the pattern here. Go and tell him his fault between thee and and him alone. If we would start right there, uh, many matters, many issues could be resolved. Go to the person, go to the person there's conflict with. Uh, at no place, there's no place for spreading gossip. There's no place for bringing other people into a situation that are not part of the solution. So he says, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man 
and a publican. Again, we're speaking of someone who's sinned against you. If they won't make it right, take two or three brethren with you. If he still won't make it right, bring it before the church. And the vast majority of the time, it doesn't even need to get to that place. But again, the point is that if you're wrong with somebody, you can't be right with God. Uh, if somebody's done wrong against you, you need to uh, forgive. The Bible says to forgive. How often should we forgive? Well, right here in Matthew 18, notice verse 21. And number one, here's what I want to say tonight. If uh, there is conflict, someone has done you wrong, number one, forgive by faith. What does it mean to forgive by faith? It means this. You may not feel like forgiving. Uh, as I've said before, someone, uh, many times people ask, how do I forgive? And what they really mean is, how do I feel like forgiving? You may never feel like forgiving. What you do is you do it by faith. The word forgive means to send away, to send away the wrong. You do it by faith. What does it mean to, to forgive by faith? It means doing it simply because God told you to. Doing it be out of obedience. Say, well, that, that's, I want to feel something. I'm going to tell you this, do things by faith and feeling can follow. But if you wait to only obey God when you feel like doing it, you won't obey God very often. So number one, forgive by faith. Matthew 18, verse 21, the Bible says, Then came Peter to him, to Jesus, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Peter wanted to sound spiritual. The Pharisees taught that you forgive three times. Peter said, well, Lord, how about seven and notice what the Lord said. By the way, we should all take great comfort in this. This is how God forgives. Notice, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. I know it's Sunday night, but somebody do the math. How many times is that? 490. Is he telling you to count 490 times? Pull out your notebook. There's 387. There's 388. Boy, you just wait. I'm going to let you have it. That's not what he's saying. The point is you just keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and forgiving. Why? Because that's what God does for us. That's exactly what God does for us. Um, notice, and then he gives, he gives a parable to explain this, uh, this, this matter of grace and mercy and forgiveness. He says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon... One was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. If you do the math, 10,000 talents is many years worth of salary. How could he possibly owe his master many years worth of salary? By stealing it, by embezzling it, by crooked dealings. But notice verse 25, but for as much as he, this wicked servant, had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Can I ask you a question? Could this servant ever pay that debt back? He never could. Not in a thousand lifetimes. Could we ever pay the debt back to God that we owe to God for our salvation? Could we ever pay him back? We never could. If I got what I deserved, I'd be in hell tonight. All of us would be. We'd be in hell. There's no bones about it. If we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell. We'd be suffering for eternity for our own sins. We can never pay God back for the price he paid when he sent Jesus Christ to this earth to suffer in our place. We could never pay him back. But here this servant falls down before his Lord, says, have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all. That, he couldn't have done that. But notice the Lord of that servant forgives not because the servant can pay him back, but because the Lord is gracious, because the Lord is merciful. I'm forgiven because God is gracious. I'm forgiven because God is merciful. Notice verse 27, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant, the one who'd been forgiven all that debt, went out and found one of his fellow servants, Notice it's a fellow servant. The ground is level. They're equals. You know, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all just sinners saved by grace. That's what we are. Notice, he found one of his fellow servants which owed him an hundred pence. Now, when you read that, don't read that lightly and just think, well, you know, a hundred pennies. Well, what is that? It's a hundred days wages. Think through that for a minute. How many of you would like a bonus check tomorrow morning of a hundred days wages? Anybody? Yeah. How many of you are still asleep? Freak up from your afternoon nap? 
still sleeping, okay? A hundred days wages. Listen, what I, what I want to emphasize is this. This servant really did owe his fellow servant a great debt. Say, there's somebody who has wronged me. I'm not saying they haven't. There's somebody who's done me wrong. They've said things about me. They've done things. They've, uh, they've wronged me. Okay, I'm, I'm not debating that. As a matter of fact, I think if we reckoned, I'd say all of us owe other people a debt and others may owe us a debt. Well, here this servant owed his fellow servant who had been forgiven all in 100 pence. What did this man do? Instead of forgiving him, notice verse 28, it says he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Can I ask you a question? Is it feasible that he could have repaid his fellow servant? It is. It might have taken some time. It might have taken a lot of patience. But is it feasible he could have paid him back? It is. But he was having none of it. He was having none of the mercy extended to him. He was having none of the grace that had been extended to him, none of the patience that had been extended to him. And instead, he would not. Verse 30, that's the key word. He would not. It's an act of the will. It's a decision. He decided he would not forgive. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. What do you do when somebody's done you wrong, when there's Christian conflict because somebody has wronged you? Forgive by faith. I don't feel like it. That's the point. Forgive by faith. Now if it helps you, do what Jesus did when he hung on the cross. When Jesus hung on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, what? For they know not what they do. He didn't focus on their wickedness. He focused on their weakness. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. By the way, Ephesians 4, 29. In fact, turn there, please. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 29. Uh, these are fairly common verses. I encourage you to memorize these at some point. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, notice this, for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Can I help you with something else when it comes to forgiveness? If you are struggling to forgive someone for their own sake, forgive them for someone else's sake. Maybe forgive them simply because God has forgiven you. Maybe forgive them because of one of their family members or their loved ones. Uh, God forgave us for Christ's sake. Let me say this, forgive them for your own sake. Say, but I'm angry at them, I'm mad at them. You laying there awake at night is not affecting them at all. It's just destroying you. Bitterness in your own heart destroys you. It's like poison in a bottle. It, it, it destroys the vessel that keeps it. Listen, if there's someone who's wronged you, forgive. Again, if for no one else's sake, do it for your own sake. Leviticus 19, 17, the Lord said, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Don't hold a grudge. Don't hold a grudge against them. But they've wronged me. I understand. They've wronged you. Forgive. You know what tomorrow you're going to have to do? Forgive again and again and again. How many times? 70 times 7. When you lose count, start over and keep counting, keep forgiving again. That's what Christ has done for us. Number one, someone's wronged you. Forgive by faith. Number two, let Jesus Christ love them through you. 
You know, this is the greatest opportunity to prove love is when somebody doesn't treat you right. It's the hardest time to show love. It's the hardest time. But it's an absolute, it's the best opportunity to show real love. Look at John 13, verse 34. Go to John 13, 34, if you would, please. John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. Now, that was not the new commandment. Here's the new commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you. How has Christ loved us? When we were enemies of God, he loved us. While, when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for us. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What's the new commandment? To love as Christ has loved you. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. Someone's done you wrong, let Jesus Christ love them through you. Does that mean you have to absolutely trust them now? No, it doesn't. Does that mean you have the capacity to forget? God has that capacity. You may not, I may not, but we do have the capacity to forgive. We do have the capacity to move forward in love towards someone who's wronged us. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all things, have fervent charity. What's charity? It's God's kind of love. Among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. 1 Corinthians 13, in fact, turn there, please. 1 Corinthians 13. How do I know if I'm dealing with somebody in love? Well, there's some characteristics of love. There's some characteristics of love. Again, this is not something I wait to feel like doing. This is something I do by faith. This is something I, I have to do because God has said to do it, because God has forgiven me and loved me. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Those two things are paired together. Charity suffereth long and is still kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Charity never faileth. There's Christian conflict. If you've done someone wrong, you need to make it right. If someone has done you wrong, forgive by faith. How often? As often as needed. As often as that bitterness starts to creep up in your heart. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that if you let that root of bitterness grow in your heart, what's going to happen? Many are going to be defiled. You yourself will be poisoned by it. The people around you will be poisoned by it. Forgive by faith. Let Jesus Christ love those who've wronged you through you. Number three, be willing to suffer so that the relationship can be restored. Be willing to suffer so that the relationship can be restored. But it's not my fault. Be willing to suffer so that the relationship can be restored. But they're in the wrong. Be willing to suffer so that the relationship can be restored. Listen, who is in the wrong, man or God? Man's in the wrong. But who suffered so our relationship could be restored? God did. 1 John 4 says we love him because what? He first loved us. While we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God, he first loved us. Somebody has to break the cycle of hatred. Somebody has to break the cycle of bitterness. We must be willing to suffer so that the, our relationship can be restored. Look at 1 Peter 2. Again, this is what God did for us. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 19, the Bible says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 
who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Jesus Christ suffered and left us an example that we should follow his steps so that we could be reunited with God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 8. 1 Peter 3, verse 8, the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful. Say, I know some pitiful people. No, it means be full of pity for others. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing. Why? Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Did you see that? God said, if you give blessing to those or railing on you, you give blessing to those who are uh, giving evil to you, God will give you a blessing. I'd rather have the blessing God can give any day. Verse 10, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue. Let me read just that part again. Let him refrain his tongue. Let me say it one more time. Let him refrain his tongue. What does that mean? That thing you just want to say so badly to the person who's wronged you, if you want to see good days, you want to enjoy life, refrain your tongue. Not everything we think is inspired. Not everything we want to say should be said. Say, but it's true. Not everything we, we want to say is going to help. It might be true, but it still might destroy. If we want to love life, and see good days, the Bible says, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him, notice this, seek peace and ensue it. Peace with God, first of all, but secondly, peace with man. We should seek peace. We shouldn't, we shouldn't go around looking for a fight. We shouldn't go around looking for an argument. We should be willing to suffer so a relationship can be restored. What does this mean? It means not venting to man, but to God. Say, somebody's done me wrong. I'm going to go tell everybody in the church how much wrong they've done me. All you're doing is creating havoc in other lives. All you're doing is creating bitterness in other hearts. Who should you vent to? God. Luke 18.1 says, men are always to what? To pray and not to faint. And I remember, I told this story here before, I believe, I, I was flying with Timothy down to San Antonio when he used to have surgeries uh, about twice a year. He'd have surgeries down in San Antonio, Texas. My wife usually went with him this particular time. I was going with him. He'd fly in a, a jet, an ambulance, and uh, you could sit right outside the cockpit pit, and you could look right inside the cockpit. You could talk to the pilot, talk to the co-pilot. You could see their instruments. I mean, literally, I'd be sitting here, and the pilot's right there. And uh, Timothy would be on a, a gurney of sorts, a, a bench in the back. Uh, and I remember as we're getting going, I noticed the Doppler radar on the instrument panel. It shows a little plane, a little figure of a plane. And then it shows colors, green, yellow, and red, kind of like the Doppler radar you might see on a weather channel. And uh, the pilots were talking to me. They said, yeah, they said, uh, planes and red spots don't mix. They said, if you look at the, the Doppler radar, the red spot is a storm. And sure enough, I'd look on the Doppler radar, and I'd see that the plane was diverting a little bit, and to the left was a storm. I'd look out the window, and there's a big thunderhead. So the pilot was dodging thunderheads on our way. We came to a particular point, and... The pilot said, now, I'm not going to totally be able to dodge this thunderhead. He said, we're going to have to fly right on the edge, right on the edge of this red spot. As I've said before, any time I fly, I think of death and eternity. And we started flying on the edge. And I, I kid you not, I, I, we were flying on the edge of that spot. Suddenly, two looked like lightning bolts. I thought the plane got struck by lightning. I learned later what it was. Two looked like lightning bolts flew down the side, each side of the plane. As soon as that happened, that whole screen, guess what color it turned? Red. That plane was right in the middle of the red. The whole, the whole screen was red. I said, Lord, I'm coming home. I, I, I'm ready for heaven, but I didn't want to go this way. We end up, it was a bumpy flight. We end up surviving. 
landing, and we got to the, to the runway. We got to the place where the jet parked, and uh, I asked, what in the world happened? The pilot said, well, because we were right on the edge of that storm, he said, uh, the, the static electricity built up on the plane, he said, and that static electricity went down the sides of the plane and knocked out our, our Doppler radar. I said, well, praise the Lord. I thought we'd been hit by lightning. And we started to walk around the plane, and if you know something about planes, there are these little, they look like lightning rods that are on the wings of the plane. They literally look like little lightning rods. Two of them had blown off the plane, and we survived. Praise God. They were gone. And the pilot said, we can't go anywhere until those, I think they called them static discharge rods, are replaced. You know what? If that static discharge rod didn't do its job, that plane would have been destroyed. You know what prayer is? It's your static discharge rod. So you know what I need to, I, I, I'm, I'm so stressed, I'm, so this is such a terrible situation, I don't know what to do about it. I'm going to tell you what you need to do about it instead of venting to all the people around you who can't do anything about it. You need to cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You need to do what he said in Luke 18, 1, men are always to pray and not to faint. Being willing to suffer so a relationship can be restored means not venting to people who can't do anything, but bringing it over and over and over again to God, the one who can do something about it. Being willing to suffer so the relationship can be restored means not gossiping, not going to someone else who's just going to deepen your anger. You go to someone else and say, yeah, you have a right to be angry. That's not helping you. You have a right to be furious. That, that's not helping you. It means not gossiping. It means bearing the responsibility for the restored relationship. But it's not my fault. Again, Christ suffered for us to bring us to God. Bearing the responsibility. Giving up your right to avenge and your right to revenge. And instead, leaving it in God's hands. By the way, if we notice God does a better job than we do anyway. Does a far better job. Go to, we're going to turn one more place here. Look at Romans 12, please. We'll be done. Romans 12, verse 18. Romans 12, verse number 18. Resolving Christian conflict. Again, if you've wronged someone, go to them and make it right. If someone's wronged you, forgive by faith. Let Jesus love them through you. Be willing to suffer to restore that relationship. Romans 12, verse 18. The Bible says, if it be possible. That means sometimes it isn't. But if it be possible, give everything you have. Do, give your full ability, your full resources. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Do everything within your power to resolve conflict. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. Peace with man, peace with God. Let's bow our heads together, please. Is there someone you've wronged? If so, make it right with them. Ask forgiveness, move forward. You can't control how they'll respond. It's not your job to control how they'll respond. If you've done them wrong, ask forgiveness, make amends. Go to God for forgiveness. If someone's wronged you, forgive them by faith. Forgive them by faith. Someone's wronged you, take the problem to God over and over and over again, not to other people. Be willing to suffer to resolve that conflict. Take responsibility for resolving that conflict. Say, but they've done me wrong. I want them to suffer a little bit. I'll tell you the one suffering the most is you. You hold bitterness in your heart, you're the one suffering. Again, if it helps you, forgive them for someone else's sake. Do it. If it helps you to focus on their weakness, not their wickedness, do it. But find a way to forgive. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I don't know how the Lord's spoken to your heart tonight. 
But if there's someone you need to make things right with, make it right. If there's someone who's wronged you, forgive. Forgive. They, they're asking forgiveness, forgive. Move forward. Remember Christ's forgiveness of you. Remember God forgave you for Christ's sake. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts now. Lord, may we be more like you. Thank you for your forgiveness, for your mercy, your grace, your love to us. While we were your enemies, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you so much for that. Lord, put a hedge about us now as we go our separate ways. Lord, I pray that you'll bless in the meeting to follow. And uh, Lord, again, help us to be more like you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. Right after we sing, we'll uh, have our business meeting. Um, we'll dismiss and we'll start the business meeting about two minutes after we dismiss.